Hello, my name is Matt Joyce and welcome to my Protecting Vulnerable Adults for View seminar. This session has been designed to apply to any setting in which people interact with vulnerable individuals and will empower you with the ability to identify and respond appropriately to allegations or suspicions of abusive practices. I will also discuss the ways in which the risk of abuse can be significantly reduced in order to try and prevent issues before they arise. In addition to using this video for information and guidance on the protection of vulnerable adults, you should also always refer to your organisation's policies and procedures or those issued by your local government. I hope you enjoy this seminar. The aims of this seminar are to contribute towards working cultures in which abuse of any type is not tolerated. A working culture is made up of various aspects, such as the value that's placed on people, the beliefs of those working within the organisation, and the habits that people have, either negative or positive. This session will also help you to recognise abuse and act appropriately should you discover, witness or be told about potentially abusive practices. By the end of this seminar, you'll be more aware of the different types of abuse and their indicators, the factors that can make abuse more likely, what you can do to make a positive difference in your workplace, the do's and the don'ts relating to disclosures, and how to record allegations or observations of abuse appropriately. The aims of this seminar are to make you more aware of the different types of abuse and their indicators, the factors that can make abuse more likely, what you can do to make a positive difference, the do's and don'ts relating to disclosures, and how to record allegations or observations appropriately. A vulnerable adult is an individual who is particularly susceptible to abuse, exploitation, manipulation or mistreatment. A number of factors can make an individual particularly vulnerable. It may be a physical disability, a mental health problem, a learning disability or another emotional or psychological challenge. An individual may recognise themselves as vulnerable. However, it's more often the case that the person concerned will not realise their vulnerability thereby placing them at a greater risk. Abuse takes many forms and can present itself in a variety of different ways. It's an interesting topic as each individual will have a different perception of what constitutes abusive practices. Something which I consider to be abusive, you may not, and vice versa. There'll certainly be things that we agree upon, but there'll be other more subtle types of abuse on which we may never agree. The reason for this is the way in which our lifestyle, previous experiences, childhood and upbringing really shape the way we perceive what is versus what isn't abusive. Abuse can be a single isolated act, however, we often find that abuse consists of a series of abusive actions which steadily increase in severity. An abuser will begin small and as they gain confidence or the cooperation of colleagues, they will conduct increasingly serious behaviours. This will generally continue until the person is caught. Who is a vulnerable adult? It may be someone with a physical disability, a mental health problem, a learning disability, or another emotional or psychological challenge. What is abuse? Abuse takes many forms. Everyone will have a different perception of what is and isn't abusive. It can be a single isolated act or a series of acts over a period of time. There are seven different categories of abuse and we'll have a look at each one individually. Physical abuse is generally committed by people in positions of power, either physical power, hierarchical power, i.e. they're in a more senior position, or in terms of their mental capacity. Mental capacity focuses upon an individual's ability to fully understand a given situation. Physical abuse will not necessarily result in a physical injury. After all, we can cause pain to someone without, without leaving visible markings. Physical abuse could include beating, pushing, slapping, rough handling, false feeding, or the causing of pain. The indicators of physical abuse may be unexplained injuries or injuries without a fault or convincing explanation. There may also be bruising associated with physical abuse, which, if in various stages of healing, 
can indicate repeated injuries over a period of time. Physical abuse can also manifest itself in behavioural terms through an individual shying away from physical contact, rapidly losing weight or wearing more clothing to disguise injuries. Physical abuse could include pushing, hitting, rough handling, false feeding or causing pain. Some of the indicators could be unexplained injuries, bruising, someone shying away, rapidly losing weight or disguising injuries. Sexual activity is abusive if the recipient didn't consent, if the individual did consent but did not have the mental capacity to understand what they were consenting to, or if someone is pressurised or tricked into an unequal relationship with an individual who has power over them. Sexual abuse can manifest itself through physical terms, but it can also manifest itself through the behavioural terms and the way somebody behaves, which may be more likely to be noticed. Some of the general behavioural indicators include signs of depression or stress, a significant interest in, in change in the person's sexual outlook, or the onset of incontinence for no apparent reason. Sexual abuse. Sexual activity is abusive if the person did not consent or the person is pressurised or tricked. Some of the indicators could be injuries such as finger-shaped bruising, signs of depression or stress, a significant sudden change in sexual behaviour or outlook, or the sudden onset of incontinence. Financial and legal abuse is the deliberate exploitation or manipulation of an individual's legal or civil rights. It includes things such as stealing a person's property, denying somebody access to legal advice, or restricting somebody's freedom of movement. Financial abuse could, consi could consist of stealing money from a, a vulnerable individual or misusing their financial details for fraudulent purposes. Financial and legal abuse could include stealing a person's property, denying someone access to legal advice, or restricting someone's freedom of movement. Some of the indicators could include someone not having the things that they should be able to afford, or someone not having freedom of movement or choice. Institutional abuse is a set of practices, policies or procedures which violate an individual's rights. These actions may be formal, written company policies or informal agreements within the workplace. Generally, these practices ease the running of the organisation and are for the benefit of the employees rather than the clients they serve. Institutional practices are those in which vulnerable adults are not treated as individuals and punishment is used to control and disempower. Examples inc include adults being told what to do, i.e. it's now time for you to go to bed. This abuse is something that happens over a period of time and happens when the person has no choice. They, uh, they have to comply with, with what they're being, they're being told to do. Institutional abuse could include using punishment to control people, putting staff needs ahead of customer needs, and some of the indicators could include people being punished. You were late today. You can't come for the rest of the week. Or people being told what to do. It's now time for you to go to bed. Emotional abuse is complex as the signs that it's taking place can be very difficult to detect. Whilst the effects on the recipient can be hugely destructive. This type of abuse can include provoking a fear of violence should an individual not comply, as well as bullying, humiliation and, and ridicule, a general lack of respect, shouting, swearing or using derogatory language to or in reference to an individual. It is very difficult to identify with great reliability the indicators of psychological abuse because each person will respond differently. Therefore these indicators should be used with, with caution. It's generally considered that people who are psychologically abused will become emotionally withdrawn, very passive, may show extreme negativity towards certain individuals, both the person abusing them and the people they think they should be helping them, or they may constantly seek reassurance. Emotional abuse could include 
making people feel fearful. Bullying, humiliation and ridicule, a general lack of respect, shouting and swearing at people. Some of the indicators could be when people are emotionally withdrawn, very passive or in need of constant reassurance. Neglect or acts of omission are when an individual undertaking a task doesn't undertake that task properly or doesn't do things that they should be doing that thereby then has a negative effect on somebody else. It could be deliberate or due to an oversight. Either way, the individual concerned is not conducting themselves appropriately. It could be somebody not performing a task which is expressly stated in their job description, not following the guidance or instructions of their manager, or not following the rules and regulations of their employer. An example could be not following risk management procedures, thereby placing a vulnerable adult at an increased risk of injury. Neglect is also difficult to identify as an individual with mental capacity may decide to live in a way which we find acceptable. Generally, neglect presents itself through a vulnerable individual who is not dressed appropriately for the weather, who is in poor physical condition, regularly misses medical appointments and is not taking their medication. However, it has to be borne in mind that an individual may choose to live a particular lifestyle or dress in a particular way. If someone has the mental capacity to make those choices, it's their decision to make. Neglect or act of omission can take many different forms. More specifically, it includes situations where employees are not doing things which are their specific responsibility. For example, not following risk management procedures and putting somebody who's vulnerable at a particular risk of harm. Discriminatory abuse is targeted at a particular individual specifically due to their ethnicity, religious beliefs, gender, sexuality, disability or other explicit characteristic. This type of abuse can take many specific forms but generally manifests itself through name calling, full segregation or a lack of respect towards an individual's personal preferences. For example, someone's clothing choices. The indicators of discriminatory abuse are in many ways similar to those described previously. The main difference, however, is that the motivation behind the actions is different. Why have they chosen this particular person to abuse? Although abuse can happen anywhere and at any time, there are a number of factors which can make abuse more likely in a particular environment. The following are a few of the key factors which apply to most workplaces. The first area we're going to look at are cliques and the keeping of secrets. Cliques are informal groups within a workplace. The basis of the group is generally trust and collusion. And although many such groups are not initially conceived for any wrongdoing, they do generally lend themselves to forms of misconduct, with group members supporting one another or overlooking the actions of other group members. Generally before cliques is the keeping of secrets, as most cliques require members to ensure that certain information does not leave the particular group they're involved in. Therefore, should a colleague or customer come to you during working hours and ask, can you keep a secret? What would be your response? If you say yes, then you risk them telling you something that you then realise that you have to disclose to your line manager, thereby breaking the trust between you and the, and the person who told you. If you say, tell me what it is, then I'll tell you whether I can keep it, that doesn't really work either, as once they've told you what they're going to tell you, it's then too late for you to make the call. Therefore, the only solution is to say, anything you tell me, I have to tell my line manager, their manager or another manager, and there's no negotiation. This makes it clear that you are unprepared to jeopardise your position by keeping a potentially volatile secret. The next area we're going to discuss are where there's only downward communication within an organisation. Downward communication within an organisation is where the owner speaks to the manager who then speaks to the employees. The people at the top of the hierarchy don't know what's happening at the bottom. 
It's essential that there is a two-way flow of information in order to ensure that managers and business owners know what's happening within the workplace. It's only through awareness that they're in a position to challenge inappropriate behaviours and identify whether policies, practices and procedures are actually working in reality. The next area that we're going to be looking at is called the diffusion of responsibility. It's essential that everyone within a workplace takes it upon themselves to challenge or report inappropriate actions. Those who stay silent, who deny the existence of abuse, and just turn, turn away when things are happening are just as guilty as the perpetrators. If we identify that abuse is taking place, we have a simple choice to be part of the problem and stay silent and go along with what's happening or be part of the solution. Make a stand and challenge or report inappropriate actions. The final area in this section are situations where there's confusion between consequences and punishment. So what's the difference between a consequence and punishment? Here's an example. If I were to be driving along and saw a speed sign stating that the maximum speed was 30 miles per hour. If I were then to ignore the sign, travel at 40, hit somebody, hurt them, and feel bad about my actions, would me feeling bad be a consequence of my actions or a punishment for my actions? It'd be a consequence. Here's a similar scenario. If I were to be driving along, saw a sign stating 30 miles an hour, Again, if I was to ignore the sign and travel at 40, but go through a speed camera and receive a speeding fine, would that be as a consequence of my actions or would it be a punishment for my actions? In that case, it would be a punishment. But what's the difference between the two? Why is one a consequence and the other a punishment? It all has to do with a link, a connection between the different components. There's a direct connection between you driving too fast, hitting somebody, hurting them, and feeling bad. Whereas if you drive too fast and receive a fine, the only thing that links the two things together is the law. Without the law, the two elements would be totally and completely unrelated. In terms of customers behaving inappropriately, no one can live a life without consequences. And it's important that should any customer behave in a way which is inappropriate, it be made clear that their behavior is not appropriate and, that, and it's, it's, it's not on to act in that particular way. And should it continue, that there will be consequences. However, it's always important to ensure that the implications are consequences and not punishment. Remember, punishment is focused upon retribution and making a person suffer. It is not positive, and is not conducive to positive working cultures. Which factors can make abuse more likely? The cliques and the keeping of secrets. Cliques are informal groups within a workplace. Where there's only downward communication, where the people at the top of the organisation do not know what's happening at the bottom. More factors are the diffusion of responsibility. People not taking responsibility for speaking up about abuse. Consequences versus punishment. People punishing others rather than explaining the consequences for their actions. The key to making a positive difference is all about empowerment. Asking ourselves what specifically we can do to ensure that vulnerable adults are empowered and have control over their lives, the things they do, and the lifestyles that they choose to lead. Here are some of the key things that you can do. Ask. Ask if you can assist someone and what assistance they need. If a person doesn't need or want your assistance, don't push yourself onto them. Just because we perceive that somebody needs help, they actually may not. Always bear in mind that if someone never gets the opportunity to learn to do something, they will never learn 
and therefore never attain the degree of independence that they might have otherwise enjoyed. Promoting choice. It's always important to promote choice, to help people to understand the choices that they have and present information in a way that they can understand. Break down any jargon and check to see if the person is able to comprehend what it means to them. The same principle applies to complaints processes. Many people will not realise that they have the right to complain or to refuse of services altogether. So it's always important that we make it clear to people that they have options. What can we do to make a positive difference? Ask if you can assist someone and what specific assistance they need, if any at all. Make it clear to people that they have options, have the right to complain and have the right to make their own decisions. You may be in a position where you witness an action by a colleague or a customer towards another individual, which you may deem to be inappropriate or possibly abusive. Alternatively, you may be in a position where somebody tells you about such an action, something that's taken a place in the, in the past. The steps you take next are important as they will help to protect both the person who's possibly being abused and yourself. What you should do is stay calm because it will help you to retain more information and function more logically. You should also listen and observe carefully. Where did the incident take place? When did it take place? Who else was there? You also need to be aware that there's forensic evidence in the case of serious physical or sexual abuse. So therefore, encourage the person not to clean themselves or the environment where the abuse took place until the police arrive. It's important that you report the information to your line manager immediately. Any delay could cause the abuse to continue whereas an extended delay could imply that you actually agreed with what was going on. It's also important you make a written record, and we'll be talking about this in more detail later in the session. There's also some key things that you should not do. If a person makes a disclosure to you in the first instance, it's important that you don't bombard them with questions and press for detail. Initially, the key is to allow the individual to share with you the information that they feel is important. This is the information which should be conveyed to your manager for them then to then action. Do not contact the alleged abuser. The allegation could be true and the abuser could attack you or the allegation may be completely false. Making a written record. If someone makes a disclosure to you about an action that you have not personally witnessed, it is best in the first instance to encourage them to write down what has happened themselves. After all, they were there and therefore should be able to make the most accurate account of what took place. If a person is unable or unwilling to write it down, this is something you could do for them. However, ensure that any words you use are theirs. Do not add or remove any information. Use their exact words. It is also essential in these cases that the person signs the statement in order to validate that they agree to the contents. In cases where you observe the potentially abusive or you know, inappropriate behaviours, it's important to record the following. The date, timing, setting in which the allegation was made or the event was witnessed. Who else was there at the time? the time and the date when you made the record, the facts, be careful when expressing opinions as you may be asked to back these up. Always separate facts from opinion and be clear about the facts of the, of the case and what specifically happened at that specific time. Dealing with disclosures. These are the specific things that you should do. Stay calm. Listen and observe carefully. Where did the incident take place specifically? When did it take place? And who else was there? Be aware of any forensic evidence. 
Report the incident to your line manager immediately and make a written record. Dealing with disclosures. These are the key things that you should not do. Do not contact the alleged abuser. Do not initially press for detail if you're being given information by a witness or someone who's been abused. When making a written record, note the date, time and setting. Who else was there? The time and date when you wrote down what happened and the facts, exactly what happened. I'd like to close this seminar with a couple of things for you to think about. We cannot control the behaviours of others, therefore sadly we will never totally eradicate abusive practices. However, there is one person's behaviours who we can 100% control, our own. Make the decision today to be an excellent role model for others. Be mindful of your actions, the things you say to colleagues, the things you say to customers, the things you say about colleagues and customers. And if you identify abusive practices or things you're not totally comfortable with, be the person to stand up, to make a stand and to make a difference. Think about the way we behave. Think about the way you interact with other people. We're all role models for others. I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you for listening. <laughs>